We got Gorgeous George coming to us from Las Vegas here on the Fightly Report. And a Happy New Year, of course, to you, Gorgeous George. Thank you for being on the Fightly Report today. And everybody can check out MMA Junkie Radio Podcasts. Released every Monday and Thursday, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Audio Boom, and other streaming platforms. And catch it on MMAJunkieRadio.com as well. And we appreciate you uh, joining us. So again, George, Happy New Year. Obviously, we're excited UFC is back in 2021. The first event, of course, is this Saturday. UFC on Vegas. I mean, at UFC Fight Island, rather. Uh, and that's going to be a great uh, way to kick things off with Holloway and Catter in the featherweight division. So, you know, right off the bat, how are you feeling about uh, the, the fight card? And, you know, how, how much anticipation do you think there'll be for it? Hey, Sean. Uh, Good to be back on the Fight League Report. Yeah. And Happy New Year. Yes. Uh, I am looking forward to some fights, you know. It was a nice little three-week break, I guess. And... Luckily, this is around the time where football's deciding, you know, on all levels, they're champions. So you got the NFL playoffs, which were mm -hmm. outstanding. We had the national championship game, which is on right. So a perfect little segue until we now start to kick things off for MMA. It's not like we have this season, but we rarely have like three weeks off. So that was cool. And how about that fight between Holloway and Cater? That's a sick one to start the year off with. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm looking forward to this fight and just you know gaining the opportunity to see these two perform anytime is going to be amazing, especially on Fight Island. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Them going back to Fight Island, you know, it, it, it's it's a nice little break because I really don't mind it from the Apex Center, um, but the reality is they got to get part of that international roster in. And some of those guys and gals from different parts of the country, it's just a lot easier to facilitate them through Fight Island. At the same time, uh, look, they're going to have some fans in attendance, so that's a good thing. At the yeah. same time, though, that bubble, that 10-mile radius bubble is not in existence. So it's going to be a little bit like Vegas where they got the fighter hotel all to themselves. I believe they have another secondary hotel. Yeah all to themselves, and then the arena, but that's it. There's no big bubble. So right. now that beach, the Formula One area, yes. it, you know, you have to be really careful. I'm not, even, I'm, I'm not even sure if they're allowed outside of their little areas. So it's going to be a little bit different, you know. It's going to be a little yeah. bit more challenging, but we have to start to move on a little bit. And the one thing you can't deny, the people from Abu Dhabi, is mm -hmm. the, the details, you know, and into yes. the go to a uh, hosting events mm -hmm. and uh, do their best to keep everybody safe. Yeah, that's true. And I talked to Tyson Chartier, who's, you know, the manager for Calvin Catter and also his head coach. And he said yeah, exactly what you're saying, that they're going to be just strictly to the hotel. All the features of Fight Island that were there before aren't going to be there. And the fans will be there in attendance, obviously. And I think that's a, a good thing because I think Fight Island is definitely a trademark for the UFC. Like, this is something they could continue to do even after uh, COVID-19. Like, people will want to pay to go there, and, and it'll be accessible for more fans. So, that'll be exciting as well. Yeah. Well, look, and how about the fact that in a week, you know, after they start the, the run of fights, because it's going to go Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday... A week later, the notorious Conor McGregor's back, the biggest figure in our sport ever. You yes. know, he's back. Unfortunately, it's not for a title, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Regardless if Habib is retired or not, this fight won't be for a title. Well, obviously, if Habib was for yeah. if Habib was still champ, this wouldn't be for a title. So, really, the point is the fact that if Habib and Dana meet and Habib reiterates to him that he's still retired, the fight won't be for a title, and that, that kind of is disappointing to me. Yeah, I understand. But uh, still, we get five-round fight. It's a big main event. And I don't think Conor needs to be in a title fight every time for it to, to sell, obviously. You know, but everybody would love to see that rematch. He doesn't. Be. But yeah. again, if Habib's done, he will have been done for about three months now. Mm -hmm. So for the UFC to jump on this golden opportunity with two top five guys coming off wins right. to be involved in a title fight, I think is they dropped the ball. In my so you're right. Conor doesn't have to be in every title fight, but... This would be one of those where, 
it makes sense. His last loss was to the to the guy that just retired. Right. Comes back, gets a win over Cowboy, Poye, Gila, lost to oh, comes back, gets a win over Hooker. You know, Ferguson out of the picture, two services, and everybody else like Hooker or Felder or you know, a few others I can think of, I guess, have just picked up these recent losses that kind of have them out of the equation. So I'm not one of them guys that runs and says, Connor, Connor, we got to put him in a title shot any chance we get. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I'm not one of those guys. But in this instance, I, I think it would have been the right thing. Definitely. Well, let's look at the card uh, that we have ahead for us, uh, uh, George. And I think it's a fun one. I do like the fact that, you know, we've got this great main event. And we've also got fighters that we haven't seen in a while, like Santiago Ponzinibbio, who's going to be on there as well. Got Joaquin Bugley, who's going to be on there. And Punel Soriano against Dusko Todorovic, because these are two undefeated guys. So we'll start off with that fight between uh, Todorovic and Soriano. Soriano 7-0, uh, Dusko Todorovic 10-0 in the middleweight division. Both of these guys, they love to get in there and, you know, bang. Both are great strikers. How do you feel this fight's going to be? Well, you said it. Somebody's over must go. We talked to Punel Soriano about a week ago. And he realizes that this is really, really a big fight. Even though it's early in both guys' career, it'll be pivotal in the sense that whoever stays undefeated will have now a few fights under their belt in the U.S. Their climb is going to be really, really quick. You know, a lot quicker than whoever suffers that loss. Uh, a prime example of this is Israel Adesanya. You know, Israel Adesanya, what, I think in 18 months he became an interim champ. And then a few months later, he became the... Uh, undisputed champion why because he was undefeated and you just take you know it's like you ever at the airport with your buddy and you got that buddy that just when it's time to go up the stairs he jumps like two or three at a time mm-hmm. oh going off you know and, and we're just taking our one step like yeah what's your hurry or whatever but some people like to climb big stuff that's what undefeated fighters do is they take those big jumps especially if they look good in the process uh, so this could be very, very big in the sense that if Puna were to win, then he, he, or whoever, if either guy wins, they're just taping, taking those bigger steps because that shiny O, it means something. And that yeah. comes from Joe. Joe Silva used to love a good record. That that was their longtime matchmaker, and he liked to reward fighters that had good records when they won by putting them in bigger matchups quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you lose, it's like a typical loss in the UFC where it can be a setback of, 18 months to two years so you can be back almost in the similar position right you know whether you're breaking into the top 15 top 10 top five uh the number one contender or whatever um and you know i'll give you an example of that when we get to holloway and and cater this could be that type of die for uh holloway uh if there's a certain scenario that, that could really really hurt holloway definitely i yeah. like puna i like puna in this one you do. Uh, what did you get to Dorvik's last performance, man? He uh, he got another tough guy in Dequan Townsend. Uh, big TKO finish. That was his official UFC debut. And then, you know, following up from his contender series fight as well. These contender guys, man, there's something else. Um, yeah. Of course, I'm impressed. And, you know, it's it's too early, I guess. I, I hope I didn't. I hope nobody misinterprets what I say in terms of I'm not saying that the winner of this fight is on Adesanya's heels in no way. Right. Uh, it's just a middleweight. It was He was a middleweight and an undefeated guy and somebody who who accomplished a lot in a short amount of time. But, yeah, they still got work ahead of them for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's the right time for both guys. But I'm still going to go with Soriano. Uh, but I, I, I'll never lie to you in the sense that, sure, he's at the same gym that I guess I'm – kind of a part of okay. the extreme couture gym here in vegas i do tend to homer and i don't hide it um but puna can crack and i think he's going to be able to catch him uh i think todorovic is a pretty solid middleweight though make no mistake yeah i'm gonna go with todorovic on this one i don't know i just kind of playing opposite from you for this fight i think they're both gonna you know be fantastic fighters no matter what happens after this one you know obviously one guy's gonna go you know, go stay undefeated. One guy's going to go home with a loss, but I still think they have a lot of potential. Yeah, man. Yeah. Look, it's not going to be too devastating. They're a little bit early still in their yeah. development. So 
whoever loses will still be able to come back, and it's not going to be too devastating, I mm. guess. Um, but, you know, you still want to be able to pick up these Ws here uh, along the way, and I don't know. I, I, I Like I say, I don't want to jump the gun too early, but I'm really reminded of Vittori and Adesanya about two years ago, two and a half years yeah. ago, and how that fight went in different directions. Where one guy's driving in a fancy car right now, you know, and and is undefeated, and he's got plenty of bling, and the other guy took that rough road. Uh, shout out to Marvin Vittori, he's back now, you know, he's back yes. as a top ten guy. But boy, was it a long, frustrating road for him. Something yeah. similar to that is what I see. Definitely. And then the next fight, another great one, uh, one eighty-five pound fight uh, between uh, Joaquin Buckley, Alessio. That Chaherico, and I think this is a fun one because you know Buckley has you know captured many attention because of that huge you know highlight kick. You know that was the knockout of the year on many uh, different MMA reporters lists, and uh, I thought it was a fantastic fight, fantastic performance, and he followed that up with another big knockout as well. So Joaquin Buckley is really you know proving that he's not just a one you know one knockout wonder guy you know he's he's coming back and he's uh <clears throat> he's 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 had back to back wins yeah i think the Sherico, he was in our studio very very nice guy mm. about a 3 years ago maybe 4 years yeah. ago and such a cool cat i remember he was from canada and he was actually training with the same guy that was training Frank Mir at the time, a guy named Angelo Reyes who comes over from the boxing world. And he was oh, yeah. trying to make a mark as a coach in the, in the MMA world. But uh, I really like Joaquin Buckley's athleticism and power. And uh, I, I think he's going to be too much for DeShirico. DeShirico is a, a good fighter. It's just that um, I don't see the upside I see for him as I see for uh, Buckley. And it has nothing to do with the highlight kick, highlight reel KO right. kick of the year or nothing like that. It just really has to do from a pure ath athleticism, explosiveness standpoint. That guy's got a, a unlimited potential. Yeah. The Jericho really needs this window. I'm just looking. He has three losses in a row. His first was to Kevin Holland, Magmad Muradov, and his last fight to Zach Cummings by decision. All of them are decision losses as well, so... I think he desperately needs this win to stay employed by UFC. It's safe to say. Yeah, you are not wrong. DeShirico definitely uh, needs the win uh, to hang on to his job. And that's that's kind of where he's sitting at right now. You know, he's kind of a placeholder towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and to get out of something like that, you got to beat somebody like Buckley. you got to beat somebody like Buckley and then follow it up with another win and get on some sort of a streak of, of your own. Otherwise, this is going to be the type of breakdowns that come their way. It's not like he's not talented. It's not like I don't yeah. like his refined striking. It's just he hasn't been able to blend it all at one time enough to impress me to think he could be some sort of a powerhouse within this division. I'm going with Buckley with a win on this, and what about that potential fight between, uh, there's a lot of heat between, you know, uh, Buckley and James Krause. Would that be a potential it's fight? It's gotta happen, right? It's gotta happen. I'm sure there's a huge story that uh, needs to be told in terms yeah. of what may have gone wrong when Buckley trained with Krause, but yeah, look, they've done the job, and why it hasn't happened sooner um, is beyond me. As soon as I saw that type of heat, yeah. even if I have to take it, uh, I would jump on it, you know? Yes. So we'll see, man. Kraus can go on one of these rolls or sometimes you'll, you just won't see him for a year because he's so in, um, entrenched in his coaching. He really loves the coach. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he'll peel off three fights in six months, you know? So hopefully we can, hopefully we're not denied of this because I really want to see that one. Definitely. I mean, he has some star pupils in his, in that he's training, you know, obviously Megan Anderson, he's in her corner and then he's also going to be in the, in the corner of, uh, um, a couple other great fighters. So, you know, obviously, you know, that, that, that come through his gym. So that's always been a priority for him, you know, as well. Look, man, that guy's going to be in the sport for a long time. And, you know, the other day I sat, on, sat in on an interview with 
uh, Mike Vaughn and Goes was doing the production, and, mm. and he was talking to Michael Chiesa, and Michael Chiesa just felt so relieved that he had found something as an analyst. They have used him, I think, uh, 10 times, he said, and he feels like he's getting better at it, And but now he's focused on fighting because he's got you know a big fight coming up against yes. Daniel Magny. Um, but it was this relief that MMA as a career has paid off for him, and he's got other options once he's done fighting. He, he did not stop telling us that the fight game is what he uh, obsesses over the most, and he wants to be a world champion. And I think Kraus is very similar, although I don't I don't think I've ever felt from Kraus that he has this yeah. desire to be a world champion, like this fire in his belly. And I guess truth be right. told, you know, he's smoother on those than maybe Michael Chiesa is. Michael Chiesa is, in any ranking you see him, he's up there. Um, but it's the fact that I think he's been able to to create businesses, you know, whether it's his gym or some of the other businesses that he's got, uh, along with him being an outstanding coach, allows him to have some fun, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. I love those guys, Kraus and Kiesa, and following yeah. following what they're doing. Buckley is more like, I'm here to fight, you know what I'm right. saying? So that this one's going to have an interesting uh, storyline, like mm-hmm. coach, fighter versus fighter, yeah. and then whatever else. And add to it whatever they want to reveal to us, but uh, I can't wait to see it. In the meantime, I, you know, like I think we're on the same page. Buckley for me in this in this fight yeah. by KO is my prediction. Yeah, me too. I'm going to with Buckley with my knockout. Uh, the next fight is uh, Santiago Ponzinibbio versus Jing Lang Li, and we haven't seen uh, Ponzinibbio in quite some time compete in the UFC. I think his last fight was against um, Neil Magny. We haven't seen him. That's 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 about a, a little over a little over two years now. Yep, he passed the two-year threshold, I believe, in November. Yeah. And uh, I was gonna remove him from the USA Today Sports rankings, but I gave him a little bit pass, and the reason is because of COVID. COVID, I think, made it very very difficult for a lot of fighters to get fights for the promotion to put yeah. fights on. Um, he also had a, I believe, it was a. Infection in his blood is what it revealed to one of, at least on one of the interviews I saw on our yeah. website. So he just had, you know, something really out of the norm in terms of, uh, you know, uh, a setback, you know, that, that you don't often hear about. We hear about, like, torn labrums and ACLs yes. and things like that, concussions, you know, anything related to a concussion. But his was a little bit different. But either way, once I saw he was on the books, I was willing to let him extend past two years because he's had an impressive run. He was he was doing what he was doing around the time that Kamaru Usman was doing what he was doing. I remember right. him, Vicente Luque, Kamaru Usman, uh, Rocky Edwards. They were building these quiet streaks while the other guys, like your Woodleys and Thompsons and Mayas of the world, were kind of ruling their division. Well, since then, Usman's become champ. Leon Edwards, he's going on a year and a half of not fighting. Uh, and Vicente Luque suffered a loss. Now he's gotten a couple wins, so he's back in the win column. Right. Jeff Neal just took a loss after eight in a row, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, Antonibio, I guess, missed out on paychecks and missed yes. out on being part of the equation. So now he's got a chance to win, and everybody will be talking about him. As long as he can shake off that rust and be somewhat re- decent, that guy's going to be involved in some, uh, some of those types of matchups like what we just saw with with Neil and Thompson, for example. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm taking on Zanibio. I think he might, he might start off slow, but I, I think I still, I've always liked what I've seen out of him in the welterweight division. Yeah, definitely an exciting fighter. I mean, and Jing Yang Lee is a guy that can really throw down as well, man. Can't look past Jing Yang Lee. You know, he's oh, had yeah. some knockouts to his, his, his career. <laughs> you know, some brutal ones. He's no joke. And that's a great replacement fighter, honestly. Uh, you know, when I saw that 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 uh, Ponzinibbio's opponent had fallen off, and I saw Li Jingliang step up, I thought that was great because I have been a fan of Li Jingliang for a while now. So it's not an easy out by any mistake. And if Jingliang were to win, I, I wouldn't be like, whoa, you know, I wouldn't be like the strangest thing no. I've ever seen. But I still think Ponzinibbio will be able to get the job done. Uh, you know, it's a big fight for both guys. Yeah, it is, man. I am go- leaning towards Lee just because he's been fighting more frequently. You know, there might be some ring rust on Ponzinibbio's side. And 
just from what I've seen from Jing Yang Lee, I mean, just, you know, he's had some great fights. You know, he, he, he's knocked out some tough veterans like Zach Otto and, you know, David Zawada. And his last fight with Neil Magny, hey, he, I thought he brought Magny some, some trouble, you know. It wasn't just a one-sided fight. So I think he can hang with the best at 170. And it's going to be a tough test for Santiago. I'm, going, I'm just leaning towards Lee, but, you know, Santiago's definitely got the tools to bring in. And you never know. He may come out with a win. I think Ponzi's going to come up with the right scheme. Okay. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I see what you got there. <laughs> Uh, next up, we've got a great fight between two great veterans, you know, uh, Condit and Brown. I mean, these guys, they have been all over the world. They have the scars and the stripes to prove it, you know. This is a great fight. I mean, even at this, uh, you know, level, we can see fighters put on good performances even later on in their careers. Like, you look at the Shogun and Little Nog fight. That was pretty good. That was, that was this past July. And, you know, veterans could still uh, get in there and, and perform. So I feel like it's going to yeah. be a fun fight. I always hold my breath a little bit when somebody turns 40 because... Yeah. You know they're nearing the end of their career. You're wondering if they're doing it just for the money or if they really still love fighting. But Matt Brown's as tough and durable as they get. Who can who can honestly say, I'm not a fan of that guy? You'd be yes. crazy to say that. Uh, Matt Brown is amazing. Now, that said, Carlos Condit is probably just on that level or maybe even higher because of what, it, what, it, what everything he was able to accomplish through WEC. And let's not forget, I'm talking about a guy who won the WEC welterweight title with some defenses and mm -hmm. won the UFC interim title. So he's, he's had a quite an amazing career, you know, Carlos Condit. Um, I'm glad that he finally was able to get a win because he had tailspin terribly with five losses in a row. And yeah. he hadn't fought much since 2015. Yeah. And, and I, it always ends this way. Not always, but way where it's just these runs where you're like, oh, man, it's not what I remember, you know. But we'll see, man. I'm glad he's good in this instance. We get to see Carlos Condit and Matt Brown. And yeah. I, I just wonder if it'll be the last time that we see possibly either one because they've had some wars. You know, these are guys yes. that have had some wars. And uh, I wanted to see them be dads and, and you know, husbands or whatever. And, and For sure. And move on to move on to uh, their, the next phase of their life and not suffer the repercussions of what fighting brings you. And, and these guys have suffered. I, I'm not necessarily, I mean, I'm sure they have wear and tear. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned earlier, torn labrums, ACLs, right. Achilles, whatever. But I, I really start to think about uh, concussions, you know. And yes. so I, I, um, I, I'm really looking forward to the fight and then I'll hold my breath and just make sure that, you know, they're, they're both good and ready to go and, if they choose to continue fighting, so be it. But if not, in the meantime, I'll just enjoy this fight for what it is. Yeah, I mean, we looked at Matt Brown, his last fight. He was just starched, just completely laid out by Miguel Baeza. You know, that, that second round hook, uh, left hook. It was back at, like, that was actually May 16th. That was, like, the first time, uh, the second time, like, UFC came back after the pandemic. So he's taking a lot of time off. I know he doesn't want to go out with, a, you know, with that loss. Against Condit, who is a really tough guy, you know, a tricky striker as well. It's it's going to be a fun one. I am going to be rooting for Matt Brown, but I think I have Carlos Condit winning this fight. Just he's a little bit younger. He's a little bit more um, versed. You know what I mean? I think Matt Brown's great on the ground, but if this fight is standing, I'm going to give it to Condit. Well, I would agree. Um, Condit's four years younger, mm -hmm. and... I don't know if that means he's fresher, but right. he's four years younger. And in their primes, I guess, like I said, not to reiterate it or put Matt Brown down, but Carlos Condit accomplished a little bit more. My brother likes to say, at their best, who who will win? And I think I'd have to agree with Condit, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as that being the pick. However, that said, I you know, I, I drift so much towards the underdogs and towards the... Every fight has like the A side, B side mm -hmm. story to it. Right. Some of them have a little bit of that feel good that you just got to root for something special. 
And I think that's what Matt Brown's bringing at him. He'll stick around and fight some more. Whereas I could really be seeing the last fight of Matt Brown. I mean, you see, man, even when he was at his peak and he had his, I think it was a five, six, seven, eight fight, fight win streak at one point. Mm-hmm. Remember when he would take those body shots and he would just crumble yeah. and then he'd come back and win? Um, he's had he's had quite a life. If you ever see some earlier interviews that he had on MMA Chunky Radio, man, that guy, you know, he's the immortal for a reason. He's, he's like on his third or fourth life, you know, right now. Right. He's been through a lot, but that's why I think I'm probably got a soft spot for him, root for him, but it has yes. nothing to do with me disliking Carlos Condit. I saw Carlos Condit fight in 2006, in 2005 and 2006 in Hawaii at the Rumble on the Rock tournament when he beat Frank Trigg. Nice. Um, and then he, Jake Shields as well, um, you, know, you know, in the finals. So I, I've seen Carlos ever since he was a young cat in the sport. So I've always cheered for him too. Definitely. I remember Matt Brown used to get in trouble with his mouth. He said a couple things that were not PC, or <laughs> including female fighters on oh, pay per view, yeah. and <laughs> they should be not wearing a top or something. Yeah, and, but now he's got and, his yeah. kids, man. He's yeah. Got his kids. Yeah, he's made some money, and I just want him. To, like I say, you know, he, he's. I think he's just reached a, a different uh stage in his life that yeah. I want him to enjoy. This will be one of his last fights. Yeah, I think so as well. I, I don't think he just wants to go out with that last knockout. So if this is a decision fight, I think he's happy. Like if he doesn't get you know finished, I think he's happy to go out on this one, whether win or lose. I agree with that. Yeah. And then we get to the main event of course and you know I actually for this fight, like I said, I agree with you, Carlos Connett wins this fight. Um, by decision. Then we go to the main event, of course, and then we have Calvin Catter stepping up to take on Max Holloway at 145. I enjoy both these fighters. Like, they're both finishers. They're both very athletic. Um, Catter has had put together some great wins in 2020. 2020, you know, he's got like three fights in a row, defeating guys like Dan Ige, you know, guys that were at the top of that 145-pound division, and he's uh, come out on top, and you know, Jeremy Stevens as well. I mean, he's just looked better and better every time we see him go out there and perform. And I know he's ready for this fight. This is one of the biggest fights, probably the biggest fight of his career. And, uh, you know, the Stevens, Dan Ige fight, you know, coming off that, that loss to uh, Zabit late in 2019, these were the fights he needed to get back on track. Correct. That Zabit fight is is one of those fights I've talked about where he lost it, and it probably cost him 18 months to two years to get back in this position, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a fight that had it gone five rounds, maybe Cater was going to win it. He was really, really mm-hmm. starting to come back, and he was starting to slow down. I love Calvin Cater. He's been kind of my under-the-radar guy for a while yeah. now. I love his boxing. I love his hands. He can unleash an elbow if he has to. You've seen that. Um, but yeah, it, he gets the job done with his hands. A very, very confident kid. Knows how to shut it down when he's in camp. Doesn't seem to get too distracted. Uh, and but look, he's going in against a guy who's seen it all and done it all. And Max Holloway, a guy yes. who won the title, defended it a few times, and shown some improvement in his last fight because against Volkanovski, he started open up his kicking game a little bit. You know, which I think he was getting too used to just throwing hands, hands, hands. Um, and he's more lean, and he looks stronger and more athletic. So I really love that he addressed that. And, I, in fact, I thought he won the Volkanovski fight. But tying into what I said earlier, look how pivotal this fight is. If he wins, and so does Volkanovski against Brian Ortega, Holloway's but he's nowhere to go. He can't fight a third time against Volkanovski. Yeah, I mean, you've seen how pivotal it is, it is to get the third shot. Ask, you know, Joseph Benavidez against Demetrius Johnson. He wasn't getting it. Joanna against Rose. She wasn't getting it. Anderson versus Chris Weidman was not going to get that. You know, it was going to take yeah. a while. The UFC made an exception with Chuck and Tito only because Tito was going to step in and coach. But uh, even that one, you know, Dana was not warmed to a third fight. So this is big in that if he wins and Ortega beats Volkanovski, now Holloway's uh, yeah. back in the title hunt. You know, now he's fighting for a title because Ortega would want to avenge that loss. Yes. You know? But first things first, he's got Calvin Cater in front of him, you know, and, and I'm going to go with Calvin on this one. Max has lost four of his last five, right? 
Oye, Volkanovski, uh, or uh, yeah, something like that. Three out of four, I think, is what he's lost. Yeah. So, you know, he's he's not shaking. You know, like I say, he's not shaking. I thought he won his last fight, but on record, he's got the two Volkanovski losses, the Poye loss. So, we'll, you know, we'll see. We'll see what he yeah. can make out of it. Um, I think it's going to be a, a great fight. Um, it, wrong, I have no problem with being wrong, but I think it's going to be Cater's night. And, and you think it's KO a fit? too? KO, wow. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 it's so hard to go against it'll, Max. It'll be wild, but that guy stands clean, people. Mm-hmm. It's so hard to go against Max Holloway for me. You know, I, I just, you know, been a fan of him. Everything he did, the fights with Aldo were epic. The Ortega fight coming from behind. I just think that Max has had to branch out more. Like, his training is always in Hawaii, and that's where, you know, I, I would think he would like to go out. And, try, and obviously with the pandemic, it, it can't allow for that. But even prior to this, you know, why wouldn't he go out and get some new coaches and, and just change, switch things up? He does, and he stays with the same coaches. And I'm, I don't know if that's his downfall or maybe that's, that's the only way he knows how to do it. But, you know, something had to change between the, the two Volkanovski fights. And I think that something did. I think, you know, Max looked a lot better in the second fight. He looked awake. He was fading away in that first fight. You know, especially in those later rounds. Instead, it, it was coming back in the later rounds. And um, Ketter is tough, though. I mean, it's 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 a close fight. And I, I'm going with Ketter just because I think that he he gets this win. You know, it's going to propel him. He may have be like one fight away from a title shot. And for the best the best case scenario, if his Max wins this fight, like you said, Ortega would have to beat uh, Volkanovski. And Volkanovski is the king of the mountain right now. And there's no way Max will get a rematch of him. So I'm going with Catter on this one. I think that it's going to be a tough fight for both guys. It might. I'm going with a decision. Decision? Okay. Yeah. I think Catter catches him only because I think Max... I, I just think cater has got the most refined and cleanest yeah. boxing in the, well, the featherweight division. Uh, and he knows how to catch you with power. So I think he's he's going to be able to catch... Holloway, Holloway can put it on you, man. Make oh, no yeah. mistake. He's got one of the best pressure fighting I've ever seen. And he just puts on an incredible pace. But he also can take some damage. And I just don't think he can take that against Cater, especially after so many wars now mm -hmm. as well, you know. Yeah. Um, maybe a younger Max, I suppose. But, um, I mean, I think he's only 29, but he's, he's just got a lot of mileage on that body. That's true. We'll see again. I'm happy to take the L if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I like to say Cater's pretty. Cater's hands are pretty special, man. Guess who was the last person to finish uh, Max Holloway? The only other, the only person to finish him on his record. Yeah, it'd be some uh, elite company, right? Do you know who it is? No. Dustin Poirier. Oh, he submitted him, right? Right, yeah, he submitted Mandalay him. Bay. Yes, yeah, in Mandalay Bay, yeah. So. Yeah, he submitted him in Mandalay Bay. Um, and I remember I was at UFC, UFC 130, 140 something. I can't, yeah, but I was there at that one. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be only the second person to finish him. And, you know, for Max Holloway, I, he just has to win this to stay relevant. Like, you just would hate to see him. You know what I mean? Being on like the you know the prelim highlight, you know what I'm saying? Like the prelim main event. You know, I'm not saying it's a bad spot, but yeah. just hate to see um, him his stock drop. I don't like know that. if he'll fall to that quickly because mm -hmm. he's got some key wins, so he'll always be in the conversation. Yeah. Um. So I don't know if he'll fall to to prelims that quickly, but um, he's you know they pay him well, and it's for a reason. His fights don't suck. So the loss would be costly, but only if he wants to be a world champion. But as far as still being like uh, must-see TV, Holloway will always be there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And for Cater, like, who would you match him up against if he wins this fight? If Cater were to beat Max Holloway, then I think he could probably get the next title shot. Now, I know I might get some crap from Zabit, and, um, Zabit fans yeah. because Zabit holds that head-to-head -head win, but Zabit hasn't been active, and Cater has... And I think at some point you surpass the guy that gave you the head-to-head -head loss if you're staying busy and you're winning key fights. I mean, a win against a former champion like Holloway, that's got 
You know, that that, that raises your stock. Definitely. Um, so I believe that Cater would next uh, in line for a title shot. Now, the UFC likes to play games here and there. Mm-hmm. And um, I suppose could someone else run interference? You know, somebody else in the picture that could possibly run interference? Possibly. Um if Ortega and Volkanovski is a classic, you can always run that back. Yeah. And now, as a fighter, you have to decide if you want to take another fight or not. But I think it'll be Cater next for the winner of Ortega and Volkanovski. Well, George, I appreciate you taking time to be on the Fight Flight Really Important Day, live from Vegas. So uh, make sure to check out UFC Fight Island 7. And another plus is it's going to be on ABC. Like, talk briefly, like, how, how excited are you for that? Super excited. We've seen MMA on CBS back in the Kimbo days. We've mm-hmm. seen CBS, or excuse me, uh, MMA on Fox, obviously, to the UFC era. Yes. And uh, I was asking my brother the other day, I know that they've been on NBC Sports, PFL has. I couldn't remember if, if MMA's made it on the NBC, but basically we will have hit all the major channels, especially when the following week they're back on ESPN. So ABC and ESPN, as they lead into the Conor McGregor pay-per-view, that's tremendous for the UFC and ESPN. Uh, But, yeah, I'm really excited to see them on on ABC, especially during this weekend at the NFL as well. I mean, this is an early start. Don't forget, folks, it's an early start, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific for the fights on ABC. Uh, So, yeah, man, I'm going to have all the TVs fired up, man. College hoops. NFL, English Premier League soccer, probably an NBA game squeezed mm-hmm. in there at some point, and yes. of course, the, my beloved MMA. Definitely. Well, everybody, check out the MMA Junkie Radio Podcast, released every Monday and Thursday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Audio Boom, and other streaming platforms as well. So we appreciate you as always, gorgeous George, live from Vegas. We always appreciate appreciate you on the Fight League Report, man. And uh, we'll be back on the, on the show with you pretty soon. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Any, it. Anytime. Take care. Enjoy the fight, Saturday. <laughs>